So uh, I'd like to thank you for coming to our second annual Number Theory Day. Um, our, our speaker today, Alvaro Lozano Robledo, and he's going to tell us about a very old unsolved problem. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. To, uh, hope you all join us. Uh, for the reception afterwards and then for our uh, main lecture today. So I want to talk about uh, one person and one math problem. So uh, the person is uh, some mathematician that at some point went by Leonardo Bigolo. Can I get a count of hands? How many people without revealing who this is know who Bigolo was? Very good. You know him, but uh, not, maybe not by Bigolo. Okay, so let's start with part one, the mathematician. So uh, the hero of today is uh, Leonardo Pisano. How many know Leonardo Pisano? Okay, one more. So he, of course, Pisano, um, so uh, born around 1175, uh, was also known as Leonardo di Pisa because he was born in Pisa, that's where Pisano comes from. And he was the son of Guglielmo Bonacci, so he was more commonly known as Leonardo Fibonacci, uh, which means literally son of Bonacci. And he is so famous that uh, they even make t-shirts of Fibonacci, right? So you know Fibonacci. So we're going to talk a little bit about Fibonacci today. Um, the Bigolo part, he was also known as Bigolo, and Bigolo uh, is actually a very interesting word, or a very uh, interesting old Italian word that has very different meanings as you try to translate it. So it turns out it can be translated for good for nothing, uh, it can be vagrant, it can be a wanderer, or it can be absent-minded which somehow it's very fitting for a mathematician, uh, any of these uh, adjectives. Um, but the reason why these are fitting for Leonardo in particular because it was because he was a wanderer and he did a lot of traveling. So probably they mean because he did a lot of traveling, that's why he was called Bigolo. We'll get a little more about his travels. Uh, so you probably know him uh, for some like famous rabbits problem that leads to uh, the famous Fibonacci sequence. That's what's reflected in the t-shirt. It says easy as one, one, two, three. Um, but uh, you, you really ought to know him as the most prominent mathematician of the Middle Ages. Uh, and that you should know that you owe a lot to Fibonacci, not just the Fibonacci sequence, but for other reasons. So that's a statue of him in, in Pisa. So um, Fibonacci, uh, or Pisano was uh, born son of, uh, of Guglielmo, who was a merchant, and uh, uh, he had some like diplomatic posts and some like businesses in the north of Africa that brought, uh, although Pisano was born in Pisa, he grew up literally in uh, the north of Africa. And that was much to his advantage. So, uh, so that's where he was born. There is Pisa. He traveled mostly, uh, his father was settled in Bejaya, who uh, at the time was called Bugia, uh, which is, a, a, by all accounts, just look at that, a, a very beautiful town. But the most important aspect of this is that he was in the right moment in the right place. So in Africa, during the, uh, the, uh, the Almohad dynasty, the Sultanate in North Africa, this was the Islamic Golden Ages where Africa was so much more advanced than uh, Europe was at the time. So when he went there, Leonardo learns about the Hindu Arabic numeral system, our number system that we use now, and he learned how to use it. And then he did a lot of traveling with his father around the coast and he would learn all sorts of tricks that merchants used to calculate with these, uh, this new number system. So he collected all this, and uh, in uh, the meantime, in Europe, was the Dark Ages. Uh, so it was a very, uh, a very good time to not be in Europe and actually learn in the north of Africa how to do mathematics. So uh, not only that, but uh, in 
continental Europe, they were using the Roman numerals instead of the Hindu Arabic system. And uh, if you've ever tried how to multiply numbers in Roman numerals, then you would know why mathematically Europe was in the, uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, so what they used was actually the, what's called the ancient Egyptian multiplication method, which is, I'm not going to go through it, but uh, you do all these, um, basically you have to keep like dividing by two, uh, your number, but dividing by two in Roman numerals, and then you uh, throw out all those that are odd, and then you add the ones that are even, and you get the multiplication of the numbers. But it's a very involved and not very intuitive at all uh, system, and that just exemplifies the difficulties to actually do any progress in mathematics when you are just using Roman numerals. So, uh, around the 1200, the year 1200, uh, Fibonacci uh, finally travels back to Pisa and he settles back in Pisa, probably not flying at the time, uh, but most likely some route like that or uh, by boat all the way to Pisa, uh, but Google Maps suggests flying. Okay, so, um, so he goes back to Pisa and uh, he, publishes, he publishes his first book where he collects all his knowledge that he's learned in Africa, the Liber Abaci. Liber Abaci is the, literally the book of the abacus. Uh, it's the book of calculations, so it's in a sense the very first calculus book. Without calculus, because there's no calculus, it's just how to calculate with the Roman numerals. So he's t telling people how to use, you can see them here. Uh, the fractions, the, the actual number system we use, and how to do uh, calculations and tricks, and uh, he explains how to apply this in business and economics of the time, uh, calculating profits, interest, so it's a very practical book. It's all those chapters that we uh, try to skip when we teach calculus, those are the chapters he actually was paying attention to in this book, how to use these numbers. So he became quite famous. Uh, by this book, and um, he, he really made a, a name for himself for introducing this, and people knew his name, and he started corresponding with uh, higher uh, diplomats and higher people at the court. So um, now, part two, we're going to talk about the, the problem uh, that was in the title. So what was the problem? Before we talk about the problem, we need to uh, introduce one more character in the story of Fibonacci, which is Frederick II, uh, Holy Roman Emperor. So if, you've, if you have, haven't heard of uh, this Holy Roman Emperor in particular, he was one of the most powerful people uh, ever in the world. Uh, but so Frederick II, he was at some point just king of Sicily, but then king of Germany, then king of Italy, Holy Roman Emperor, and then there's a tiny bit of orange there too, uh, King of Jerusalem uh, in 1225. So he had a vast empire and the name of Fibonacci came up uh, in his court. Uh, and at some point in uh, 1225, Frederick II uh, travels to Pisa, uh, which is, is a very nice town. Also, by the way, uh, the famous Linen Tower of Pisa was under construction back then. It took 200 years to build it from uh, 1173, uh, just two years before uh, uh, Fibonacci was born, up to like 1372. So um, Frederick II travels to Pisa, he holds court, and some of the diplomats, some of his court people, uh, by all accounts, Frederick II was actually very much in favor of science, and he was fond of having scientists and astronomers, astrologers at the time, in the court. Uh, so he, they heard about uh, Fibonacci, and uh, one of the scholars at the, ta at the time, Dominicus Hispanus apparently, suggested that the emperor should meet Fibonacci, the famous Fibonacci. Okay, so what happens was that um, another person at the court suggested that, okay, let's have some fun with Fibonacci. Since he is so smart, I'm going to collect some problems and pose them as challenges to Fibonacci. And so he did. For instance, one of the problems that he proposed was find the root of that uh, polynomial. There are no rational roots to that polynomial, so this is, uh, what does he mean by that is that to actually find an approximation. 
imagine, of course, there's no calculators at the time. So how accurate can you get of an, an approximation of that route? So that was the problem. W not the problem, one problem. So, um, so one of the problems that Palermo suggested to Fibonacci or proposed to Fibonacci was the problem. So what is the problem? Uh, the problem we want to talk about is this one. To find a square which when either increased or decreased by 5 gives a square. So what that means then is that you want to find a square such that x squared minus 5 and x squared plus 5 is a square. Okay. Uh, that also means that you want to find three squares, a square, b square, and c square, that they are in arithmetic progression of common difference five, right? Okay. So, um, just a little bit back up. Where does this problem come from? It was Palermo just like, okay, just thought, uh, you know, he had a napkin and he wrote a couple paper uh, problems. So go back to the problem of the root. Where does that one come from? It turns out that that one was uh, uh, one of the problems that is in some like uh, revered algebra text uh, in the Arab world. So Omar Khayyam uh, had written a, a number of uh, texts in algebra and this problem is one of the ones that uh, Khayyam suggests in that book. And in that book, that problem is solved um, with some like geometry, find some approximations of what these solutions should be. And Fibonacci does solve the problem. Later, later on, uh, Fibonacci writes a book called Floss, not like dental floss, I don't know. Floss is a flower, sort of like the flower of mathematics, I guess. And, um, and, and he does uh, work out that problem. He finds an approximation, a pretty good approximation in hexadecimal. Uh, notation, and then uh, he actually also proves that it's, it is not an integer, a fraction, or a square root of a fraction. So he is quite sophisticated in, in his analysis of what this root might be. And, uh, and then the congruent number problem, where does that one come from? So this already gives you a, a clue that Palermo was not just playing around, he actually went to find very hard problems or problems that were not going to be easily solved by Fibonacci. So this problem was also around for a while. It turns out that the first record we have of this problem dates to some Arab manuscript on the year 972. This is the actual first instance we have in writing. Of course, um, what we'll see later on that this is related to right triangles. In right triangles there is um, ancient Babylonian tablets that um, stones <laughs> that are uh, that deal with uh, triangles and uh, right triangles. So this is the kind of thought that it might have been around for a long time before 972, but we know of it from then. By the way, the Arab manuscript where it is uh, written, it's somewhere in the, uh, the Imperial Library of Paris. And in that problem, it's actually uh, written in generality. So if I give you an n, is there a square that the square and a square minus n, a square plus n, it's three different squares. Okay, so the congruent number problem, there it is. Um, this, by the way, uh, is called the congruent number problem. The, the number n, uh, Fibonacci called it a congruum. Uh, so that's where the congruent, uh, a congruent which is just related or uh, similar, uh, comes from, where the word comes from. And uh, so in, in a more modern language it's asking if you have a natural number, is there a rational number x when they say to find a square, they're not talking about real numbers, is can you find an actual number, uh, so a rational number such that all those three are squares. So for instance, 24 is a congruent number, because 1, 25, and 49 are uh, equidistant by 24. By the way, if 24 is um, uh, it's 6 times 4, you can divide everything by 4, and then the distance is 24 divided by 4, so is there 6 apart. So 6 is also a congruent number, because these rational numbers, which are squares, are 6 apart. Okay, So that's what it means. Uh, to be congruent. 
And um, so how are they related to right triangles? Well, uh, notice that if you have a right triangle with sides x, y, and hypotenuse uh, z, then, uh, well, they satisfy uh, Pythagoras' theorem. And then if you square x plus or minus y, you would get x squared plus y squared plus or minus 2xy. But the x squared plus y squared is another square. So this square plus or minus that quantity is a square, right? So that is a source of congruent numbers. And that tells you that 2xy is a congruent number. But conversely, you can start from squares. If you have three squares with a common difference, then it turns out that c minus a, so the bigger one, minus a or plus a, and then 2b are the sides of a right triangle. You can see it in the equation. If I square this side and that side, I get that. But this is, if you multiply by 2, divide by 2, this is the uh, the middle point between A and C, which the middle point, because these are equidistant, is B squared. So you get that that is 2B quantity squared, and the area of the triangle um, would be exactly N. Okay? You see my slides is a little bit off, because this is, uh, this is not the area. This is four times the area. So let me fix this slide. Uh, so now, if you have a triangle, I can actually uh, look at this equation. This is a little more less natural than the one we had, we, we had before, but now it's the right thing that uh, this square plus or minus the area of my right triangle is a square. Okay, so, uh, so you, now you see that there is an equivalence between congruent numbers, so triples of squares with a common difference, and triangles of area, right triangles of area n with rational sides. Okay, so we can um, rephrase again the congruent number problem as um, is there a right triangle ABC with rational sides that the area is precisely N? And this is how nowadays is better known in this format. Okay, so for instance, we saw before that 6 was a congruent number. And the uh, uh, triple that corresponds to 6 is 3, 4, and 5. The area of 3, 4, and 5 is 3 times 4 divided by 2, 6. We actually know how to parameterize uh, right triangles. So you can parameterize right triangles using these formulas. That's something that you can uh, deduce, for instance, from like um, um, with complex numbers. You can uh, prove this formula, for instance. And uh, and then the area of a right triangle like this is that, so that is always a congruent number. In playing with E and F, you can come up with other congruent numbers. For instance, N equals 30 is the area of the triangle 5, 12, 13. So 30 is also a congruent number. Okay. However, looking at this, you can see that if you sort of know your right triangles, uh, 5 is not one of these. 5 does not come from a triangle with natural numbers as sides. This is the smallest right triangle. This is the second one or so. So we've already jumped to uh, the area being 30. We're not going to get back to n equals 5. So how did uh, Fibonacci find that solution of, um, I, I, uh, spoilers, he found the solution. Um, so he did find a, a solution to that. So uh, what, what do we know about the problem? So what's the progress in the congruent number problem so far? Any questions on this second part? How much time did he have to think about the question? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I think it was uh, probably unlimited. I, I don't know. He was probably given this challenge and then he worked and then he published, I, I think he published the, the next book shortly after, meaning a few years after, um, where he talked about the solution. So I don't know that there was a timeline given, okay, you, they didn't throw him in a room and say like, okay, solve these problems in five minutes. Uh, he had time to think about them. Okay. So uh, in this book, Flaws, uh, Leonardo solved uh, uh, many of the problems that were uh, challenged uh, to him to solve. 
and uh, he finds this solution 31 over 12, 41 over 12, and 49 over 12, their squares uh, differ by 5. And um, if you think about triangles, it corresponds to that triangle. So you see that it's, there is no right triangle with integer sides of area 5, and that's the, uh, the simplest such triangle with that area. And um, he actually goes back to the problem uh, he, he mentions that he will come back to this problem later on, and he does. So there is another book, Liber uh, Quadratorum, that's not it. This is actually a copy of the, the first one, Liber Abaci, um, which was actually auctioned in 2011, uh, starting at $120,000. It's a bargain, if you ask me. Um, so in uh, Liber Quadratorum, he returns to the problem and now in full generality and he's starting to uh, think about what numbers are congruent. And in particular, in that book, he claims that if n is a square itself, then n cannot be a congruent number. But he claims that he does not give a proof of this fact. So that's in uh, about 12, uh, 1230 or something, uh, the year 1230, and uh, for that fact, we actually have to travel all the way to the year 1640 to actually see a proof that um, a square is not a congruent number. For instance, that n equals 1. There is no right triangle with rational sides of area 1. That was not actually proved until the year 1640. And that uh, we have to go now, uh, so jump in time 400 years, somewhere west to Toulouse uh, in France. This is an actual map of Toulouse in 1631, so just uh, shortly after, shortly before the time we're thinking about. So who proved this? Well, it was uh, some lawyer uh, in the parliament of Toulouse who was a math enthusiast and who is well known for not writing proofs either. Uh, who is that? Of course, uh, Pierre de Fermat, who is uh, very well known for claiming another proof that he didn't write a proof of. So, uh, ironically, he, essentially we have one proof by Fermat, and it's the proof that Fibonacci did not write. So, <laughs> that one he left. So, this, the one that he left is the one that Fibonacci didn't. Okay, so Fermat proved that n equals 1 is not a congruent number, it's not the area of a right triangle with uh, rational sides. And how does he prove this? So if you start with a, a triangle that has area a square, okay, uh, any square, so you can take m to be 1, so this is just 1 like in there. Then if this had a solution, well you have two equations, but this one, I can, uh, the A, B, and C are non-zero, otherwise this is, not, this is not a triangle. So I can solve for one of them and plug in the other equation so I have one equation. He did that. Uh, you go here, so you solve for B, in here, plug in, and then you get an equation of this sort. But he was interested in equations of that sort. He had been playing around for a while with those equations, and he actually proved that uh, a fourth power plus four times a fourth power cannot be a square. Okay? Um, Fermat is famous because he invented the, in, this is the case where he actually showed how to do it, he invented the method of infinite descent, and this was one of the cases that you can prove with infinite descent, and what that means is that if you assume there is a solution to this that is somewhat primitive, that is simplest, you can prove that there is a simpler one and therefore there would be a chain of simpler, simpler, simpler solutions that would never end and that would be impossible, or, well, the contradiction already that you assume that it was the simplest, but you find a simpler one. I'm not going to do that, but you see that this actually works into the proof of that this other solution, this other equation has no solutions, and that's the proofs we have from Fermat. So Fermat famously claimed that if you replace that with n big or equal to 3, there is no non-trivial solution, so nothing with uh, x times y times z um, being non-zero. And uh, 
the one proof he did leave behind about that theorem was the case of n equals 4. And that and this are related. But he was not just talking about Fermat's last theorem, not about that equation. He does ha have correspondence about the congruent number and n equals 1 in particular. OK. So uh, going back to that uh, trick, you can uh, just think about that equation. So a fourth power. Uh, a fourth power plus four times a square. So now if you, you don't have a square here, just have a little n, then you are going to try to solve this equation. Uh, a further change of variables will bring it to uh, this format. Okay, so it turns out that some fourth uh, power equations you can transform into cubic equations. And then it turns out that there is uh, a one-to-one -one correspondence between solutions of these type of equations and uh, triples of uh, some right triangle with area with a given area. So here's the map. Between triangles, right triangles with a fixed area n, and points on this curve. OK? And that is the correspondence from one side to the other. So let me show you how that works. For instance, Fibonacci's triangle for area n equals 5 maps to that point on that curve, on this curve. OK? And there is an interesting one-to-one -one correspondence. So you can now, instead of thinking of triples, you can just think of points on that one curve. That one curve is an example of um, or, um, vice versa. If you, if you find a point on the curve, then you can find the triangle. But that, that one curve is an example of what we call an elliptic curve, and um, which is, is uh, what many uh, mathematicians, me included, do research on in number theory. Uh, so elliptic curves have seen a lot of uh, um, uh, a lot of uh, progress in, uh, in recent years, but has uh, called for a lot of attention for many reasons. For instance, uh, this problem where they naturally appear. So this is, uh, this is my grandfather. Um, this is my academic grandfather, Serge Lang, uh, so the advisor of my advisor. And in one of his books, he writes, it is possible to write endlessly on elliptic curves. Uh, this is not a threat. And some people in the audience have written quite extensively on elliptic curves. So these are just three copies of, uh, of our Guest of Honor's books, which I, I and many others learned uh, about elliptic curves from. Some excellent books. So, uh, so that's, that's a plug for his talk, uh, which uh, will be at 4.30 today. OK, so why don't we, since that's an elliptic curve, there's a lot of volumes about elliptic curves, so that theory should tell us something about the congruent number problem. So let's grab some chalk and uh, use the theory of elliptic curves to find another triangle of area 5. So if we want to find one, but we didn't say, are there more triangles, right triangles with rational sides, and area 5? It turns out there are infinitely many of those, and you can use the theory of elliptic curves to find them. So I, I brought some chalk. Um, this is, in fact, good Japanese chalk, but uh, there are whiteboards in this room. So I brought a, a blackboard with me. Okay. <laughs> in the absence of blackboards, uh, just use your own. Okay. So first of all, we're gonna try, we're gonna write uh, we're gonna plot our curve. There are, if you look at the curve itself, there are. The zeros of that polynomial are 0, phi, and phi minus 5, so those are important to graph it. So there they are. And then there is going to be, uh, in here, the square root would be, uh, the inside of the square root of for y would be negative, so there's not going to be anything there. And the graph looks like this, some bubble, and then the rest of the curve goes like that. Okay, so what are we going to do? Here's the point that Fibonacci found in that, that's the point that corresponds to Fibonacci's triangle. And then our task is try to find another point, because each point in this curve will correspond to another triangle. So how do you find another one? So what the theory of elliptic curves tells you is that because this is a cubic curve, if you trace lines, the intersection points will be interesting points. 
And in particular in here, what I can do is do a tangent line at P. That tangent line will have a, will touch the curve twice here, and because this is cubic, the third point of intersection will be uh, another point that actually will be another rational point. It won't, it won't be like there won't be a square roots or anything because this is a, uh, if it's tangent, it will be, you see that's tangent, it will be a double point of intersection right there. So that third point, it turns out to be rational. This is something you can prove quite easily. Okay, so you find it. Do the algebra and you find another point. And there it is. Okay. All right, so now we go back, go back to our theorem, our correspondence between triangles and, um, uh, and points on those curves, and then you can plug it in. So we need to plug it in here. A point gives me a triangle, so I plug it in there, and I get another triangle uh, that has area five. Okay, good. So since that was realized, and that was According to sources long ago, we're not very clear on, uh, at least in the early 1900s, there is some already uh, significant evidence that this is being used. Uh, we're not sure when this correspondence was really uh, settled. Uh, once you know this, there is a lot of progress uh, that has to do with elliptic curves and the congruent number problem. So, um, so then, because of the correspondence, n is congruent if and only if the elliptic curve, uh, that elliptic curve has a rational point with y not equal to zero. If, if y is zero, all, all hell breaks loose, right? So um, as long as y is not zero, I get a triangle. Okay, so, uh, but however, if I give you one of these curves, finding that rational point is easier said than done. It's actually quite, challenging. I'll show you some examples. So for example, is n equals 157 a congruent number? That's a famous example uh, where if I give it to you, you know, you can take it in your number theory class, put it as an exercise, and let them run their computers or whatever they want to try it, they will not find it. Your students will not find the point. Yes? Google will find it very quickly. Yes, so you give them a calculator, you know, like here, you do it. So Google will find it very quickly. Um, so if you put a computer uh, search going on, you might expect that, well, that is not a very large coefficient. So if there is a solution, the coefficient of the solution should not be too bad. So you start searching, 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 and you don't find a solution. So a, then it's probably not a congruent number. There are no points. We'll see. So what kind of progress uh, have there been in the congruent number problem? So um, in about uh, 19, the 1950s, 60s, uh, there were so, uh, starting to be some significant progress. For instance, when n is twice a prime, and the prime is 3 mod 8, so when you divide uh, by 8, the remainder is 3. As long as the number is 2p, with p being congruent to 3 mod 8, then n is a congruent number. Okay, great, that's not 157. Uh, Stevens, though, in 1975, proved that if n is a prime and p is 5 or 7 mod 8, then n is a congruent number. That's awesome, because 157 is, a, is congruent to 5 mod 8. So that one we said before, 157 is a congruent number. So now I need to try to find that triangle. Hmm. Okay, more progress in uh, gross in 1985 proved that if n is composite, but uh, it's a product of two primes, or at most two primes, and the number n is 5, 6, or 7 mod 8, then n is congruent. Uh, Monsky uh, has proved in 1990 that uh, twice a product of two primes with some congruence conditions, then n is congruent. That's the quadratic residue symbol. Um, but anyway, some congruence conditions between P and Q, that is congruent. And then there is also uh, some, uh, I'm not listing everything that is known, but some negative results. So for instance, Ginocchi uh, proved in 1855 that if P is 3 mod 8, then N is it's not congruent. Um, so if n is a prime that is 3 mod 8, then it's not congruent. Bastien uh, 
uh, prove that n is twice a prime and the prime is 9 modulo 16, then it's not congruent and there is a bunch of other results of this sort. Okay, so going back to 157, is it congruent? Yes, by Stephen's result we know that it's congruent, so now we have to try to find it. And uh, in 1993, uh, Don Sagier found the simplest triangle with area 157, and here it is. Uh, that's the simplest triangle with that area. Uh, so you can see that it's quite difficult to find these points uh, even for an n, a small 157, um, what we call the height of the point on that elliptic curve can be quite large. Okay, so uh, you can actually use uh, the results we know and searches and things and so on to start classifying numbers. So for instance, here's a list of all the numbers that are congruent numbers up to 200. But, uh, what? Up to 200. Oh, I think this is probably known, uh, at least up to that number, yeah. Yeah, yeah, up to that, up to that number, I, I think that's, uh, that's provable, it's provable. So, um, so, what, what do we know of uh, an actual um, criterion, something like more satisfying, this is just, as I said, some like laundry list of results, he, this is a congruent number, this is not, uh, we didn't have anything that even resembled a criterion from congruent numbers up to 1983. So in 1983 there was a big breakthrough, uh, Gerald Tennell um, at Princeton at the time, uh, he uh, proved something that looks just like a criterion for uh, congruent numbers. So this is the first page of uh, his paper, but uh, in a more, uh, so how we know the theorem now is the following, that if n is a square free congruent number, so is the area of a right triangle, the rational sides, you define these quantities, okay? How many solutions are there? In how many ways I can write n in this form? In how many ways can I write n in each of those forms? Notice that these are, this is a positive number, and these are positive, just multiples of squares. So it's a finite computation, a very quick computation to check how many solutions are there of each kind, so you can compute those quickly, and then his theorem tells you that uh, if n is a congruent number and n is odd, then a n is b n divided by 2, and if n is even, then c n is d n divided by 2. So it gives you a very non-intuitive criterion, this is not what you would have expected the criterion was going to be, but it gives you a way to check by contradiction. If n is congruent, then this needs to happen. So if it doesn't happen, n is not congruent. Uh, however, what would be nice if this was an if and only if, that would be an actual criterion, but um, it turns out that it will be an if and only if if the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture is true. Okay, well more on the Sw Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture in a moment, uh, but just an example uh, is that, so if n is uh, 17, then you can check that a of 17 has, uh, uh, that set has one element, the only way you can write 17 in that form is if this is 8 plus 9, right, so there is uh, one point uh, in there, so it's a 1, b of 17 though, there are three different triples, x, y, z, that give you 17, so there's a 3, since 1 is not 3 halves, 17 is not congruent. And it was not in the list. Okay? And this is provable. This does not depend on any conjectures. You can prove that it's not a congruent number. But to prove that numbers are congruent, that's where you would need the Birch and Schrodinger Dyer conjecture. So, uh, the Birch, unfortunately, the Birch and Schrodinger Dyer conjecture is wide open. We have, well, wide open, there's uh, just some tiny bits of, of progress and uh, theorems related to the Birch and Sheridan Dyer conjecture. Um, so we don't have it. Um, so we don't have an if and only if criterion for the congruent number problem. Uh, in fact, uh, the, well, the Birch and Sheridan Dyer conjecture, there is a $1 million 
uh, attached to it. Uh, it's I mean, the BSD conjecture is one of the millennium, millennium problems that the Claymath Institute proposed. So essentially there is a $1 million reward for the congruent number problem also. Um, in that uh, they're, they seem to be quite uh, related that you would have to, to prove the congruent number problem, you have to do some like, um, uh, some progress also in some significant progress in the Birch and Sunderton diary conjecture. Okay, so I will end with a quote by Fibonacci uh, that, uh, that appears actually in Liber Abaci. So if by chance I have omitted anything more or less proper or necessary, I beg forgiveness since there is no one who is without fault and circumspect in all matters. So I'll end there. So you, you can see it uh, just a little bit in the in the paper. So it's just it, it's a um, a coincidence of of some modular forms. So it's the coefficients of some modular forms that are there's got to be an equality between these modular forms, and it will give you um, that those numbers need to be the same. Hmm? It doesn't go through alpha. It has to go through alpha. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the, it's a modular form criterion for whether the L function vanishes. Right, but then and then Birchwood and Dyer would tell you the vanishing is equivalent to having a positive rank. Right, but then, but then that was before Clip. Yeah. No, no, but, uh, so? but. Oh, that was Cross Yakke. That was after Cross Yakke? 83? No. Um, how do you know? Like, how do you know what? How do you know whether there's a point versus where the L function vanishes? That's what Birchwood and I conjecture said. That's from the 60s. But, but the theorem is like one, one way is, is definite. Oh. Um, yeah, that's a good point. If you look in the back of Co Koblitz's book on this, he gives an outline of the connection. So you don't need any of the stress on No? Okay. Oh. How did Zagi find the triangle? So um, I, I don't know exactly, but the, so through the Birch and Sonnet and Dyer conjecture, um, what the Birch and Sonnet and Dyer conjecture tells you is that. So to every elliptic curve, you can attach this L function, so some analytic function. And the analytic function uh, has, a, uh, has a vanishing at a critical point. And the residue at that point tells you some arithmetic information. And one of the pieces of arithmetic information that that tells you is the height of the point. So in a sense, the um, the Birch and Sonnet and Dyer conjecture, what it gives you is uh, w like where to look and like what is the size of this point. Uh, so it tells you about what the size of the point would be. But yeah. uh, there's more technical than that. No, no, it's, actually, it's a little different. For that. You can use that, but I don't think it would be enough for this one. I think he actually computed the heat point. So the, right. But to compute the Heegner point involves computing a special value of a, a theta function, I guess, essentially. But right, right on with the curve. Hmm? Right on, maybe it's not. What are curve not simple? The, mo the, mo the modular curve is just so big, because the conductor is that. Well, but the, conduct the conductor is. 159 squared or something. 159 squared. Yeah. yeah. So I'm pretty sure he did it by estimating the heat point numerically and rounding. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you know that question? Yeah. So if you know that number is congruent, what does that like allow you to do? Like, what's the application of it? 
uh, that, that you prove to Johannes Palermo that you are very smart. <laughs> um, I, I, as far as I know, there is no. If you're looking for a real world application, I was just curious if it like would help you to prove some other kind of thing. Um, no, I mean. Um, you find a triple of rational squares in arithmetic progression with difference n. <laughs> yeah, and I mean it's just some feature of like how actually number theory has uh, evolved that in many cases there were just these sort of like fun problems that were very challenging and they were just writing to each other with this challenge of can you solve this problem. So they didn't have uh, a particular application in mind or um, um, just, just finding these properties of triangles. Many properties of triangles have been studied just because of, for the fun of it, not, uh, but then I have found other applications. I don't know of an application of like, if you know the number is congruent, then you can try to find the point itself, um, but then not, I don't know of an application of congruent numbers per se. If you could show if you could find a congruent number that didn't fit tunnel's criterion, Disprove the virtues from Sendai conjecture and become very famous. Yeah. For, for bad Can you get a million dollars for disproving it? Yes, yeah, you can. Leave <laughs> 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 with that criterion, and that would stop the bad solutions. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming.